Um, I love just being on time, which is about, which for me is about four minutes late. So I do apologize for my tardiness. We were getting prepared with what I might say is the most prepared guest we've ever had on Self Wealth Live. He uh, has brought some charts. And when I say charts, I mean some charts. Uh, he's really turned up the the standard for the rest of us that uh, do it do like a good old finance chart. So uh, we'll be walking through them uh, tonight. And yes, we are live, Matthew. So last week uh, on the Self Wealth Live program, uh, you may have noticed that I said, um, enjoy the rest of your Friday to Cameron. And it was a Wednesday for you. It was kind of like a time warp. So I don't have a time machine. If you do have one, let me know because um, you can come and work at Rask and uh, you'll be the highest paid person. Don't you worry about that. But uh, I didn't have a time machine. It was actually pre-recorded because I was on the road in Queensland. At the time that Self Wealth Live went live, I was in Brisbane for one of our Rask events uh, that we held up there. Sold out 120 people. Uh, we needed a bigger venue than the pub, but that's okay. Food for thought, food for next year. But uh, we'll be joined by Tom Wickenden tonight. Uh, he'll be joining us from Sydney, and we'll be talking about how to build a core portfolio of ETFs and why ETFs are a good tool to use in the core portfolio. Uh, some of you who received the RASC newsletter will know that I talked about, I've been going around the country diagnosing people with something I like to call collector syndrome. It's where people buy and buy and buy and buy all different types of investments and they really have no plan and they end up becoming what I call a collector and they have too many different things in their portfolio if you ask me and it just becomes an admin nightmare. Uh, so one way to kind of flush out to your portfolio is to understand how to build your core portfolio and ETFs are a great tool to do just that. So we'll be digging into that tonight. But as always, we've got the uh, the usual antics before we kick off the serious stuff. This week's joke comes to you from Dad Says Jokes on Twitter. Why don't spiders go to school? Because they learn everything on the web. That's my joke for this week. Um, I would say pretty close to a 10 out of 10. Uh, financial freedom, it was an absolute pleasure to meet you in person. Absolutely. So uh, this week's joke. What do you reckon? Out of 10? Pretty good, I thought. Spiders? Maybe people don't like spiders. Here's a very important message from the team at SelfWealth. I'll let you just digest this for a moment on your screen. If you haven't already, it's not an orange button, but it may be red for you on YouTube or wherever you are. If you're watching this from LinkedIn, um, you can jump over to the SelfWealth YouTube channel. Uh, go and check it out. Okay, on to this week's disclaimer the bit that everyone gets up for in the morning. Rob is not with us tonight. I'm joined by Andrew from Self Wealth Behind the Keyboard. Uh, Andrew's first delightful uh, general advice warning. He'll be dropping a few into the chat this evening, of course, and uh, communicating with you. But here's my one. Self Wealth Live videos contain general financial advice only. That means the information does not taken into account your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should not act on the information until you have spoken to a licensed and trusted financial planner. You can find financial planners, by the way, on the moneysmart.gov.au website. Just put in their name or their AFSL number, uh, and it comes up with a list of their qualifications, how long they've been an advisor, which AFSL they operate under, etc., etc. Never, ever, ever, ever think that someone is a financial advisor if they are not on that list. Second part of my disclaimer. I'm the founder and sole director of the RAS Group, and there's a company number there, which is a corporate authorized representative number 1280930 of Waddle Partners AFSL 383169. You can find our financial services guide on the RASC website. Finally, the views expressed in the live streams are solely those of myself and or our guests, like Tom tonight, and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Self Wealth. And as always, as part of this uh, extra special uh, mini series we're doing in conjunction with beta shares you get two disclaimers more than you asked for so here you go i'll let you take your time to just enjoy that um so i can see that some i jj gave me a 10 out of 10 for the joke that's the best i've ever done uh martin gave me a nine geez wow well, i don't think i've ever had such high scores i'm nearly blushing um, but thank you so much um, for that. And we can get on to the more insightful part of the series. Uh, so you will know that this month on Self Wealth Live, we've had uh, a fantastic uh, competition or draw or however you want to do it um, with the team at BetaShares. We've had four BetaShares guests on the show. And as part of that, there's been an opportunity for anyone watching this um, 
with an asterisk. I don't know actually what the eligibility criteria are. I assume you have to be an Australian citizen or something like that. But uh, you can check out the link that is available in this video. So if you go onto the description area there, uh, you will see a link and you can go in the draw to win $2,000 in a BetaShares ETF. There's three prizes up for grabs, $2,000 each. Uh, you have to enter very, very soon. Um, I don't know when the cutoff is. I think it may be in the next 36 hours or something like that. So get in, do it. It only takes about 90 seconds um, and you can read all the terms and conditions in that link. So, so far we've covered why investors are flocking to ETFs. Then we went on and talked about, are you worried about the economy? I heard my mate's dad's uncle's second cousin said at a barbecue that the stock market's going to fall. Is it? Well, we had David on the show um, and he kind of gave us some refreshing uh, takes on where the market may be headed. Uh, number three, five investing themes to rule the 2020s. That was last week with Cameron Gleason. So we talked about things like electric vehicles. Uh, we talked about the transition to a China and America global economy. So many interesting things. And tonight, we're talking about how to build a core portfolio from scratch using ETFs. Uh, ben just said, these disclaimers feel like Oprah tonight. You get a disclaimer, you get a disclaimer, you get a disclaimer. Well, you do. You do indeed. Um, every every week, I think that's the thing that everyone comes along for. Maybe not so much me because I have to read them out, but maybe you guys, who knows? Um, and this says, this accountant approves of lots of disc disclaimers. Thank you, Jacinta. Okay, tonight on the show, we've got Tom, an investment specialist at BetaShares. He supports basically all of the business. He helps people like us understand what it means to invest in ETFs, how to invest in them, how to build portfolios and so on and so forth. I was just reminiscing with him off air how my experience doing the Chartered Financial Analyst designation um, was not a pretty one. Um, so I wish him all the best with that because I know how insanely difficult that program is. Uh, he's obviously enthusiastic about markets and investing. Tom, welcome to Self Wealth Live, mate. Thanks, Owen. Great to be on this evening. It was a hell of an intro. I feel I can live up to my graphs. <laughs> well, I must admit, you do have some of the best graphs that I've ever seen. Um, so kudos to you, mate. And um, good luck with CFA Level 2. I know how hard it is. Having failed it myself, I know mm. how hard it is. So, uh, yeah. mate, all the best. No, appreciate it. In the, in the thick of it at the moment. So fingers crossed for November 22nd. Yeah, all the best. I'll be thinking of you. Okay, okay. mate. Tonight, we are going to be talking about all things. We're going to be talking about like more of like a professional view of how to actually use ETFs to build a portfolio. So I've got a question. This is more like a surprise gotcha, um, but I noticed that you got the notes in advance and you put together a chart for this. So I am going to bring this up on the screen here for everyone's benefit, and I'll mm -hmm. pop us down the bottom here. We have seen, I would say, at least from technology shares, something that was really surprising. So you can see the returns here. Have these returns of the various different types of investments so far this year surprised you? Yeah, they, they definitely have. And the reason I was able to whip this or, or send this chart over so easily is we'd actually already put this together because it's something we've been talking to with our clients. I think what, what we're seeing here is you know, what, what we're displaying is in orange, the returns of asset classes in 2022. And in black, the returns of those same asset classes in the first half of 2023. And a lot of commentators, you know, and I'd say the majority of, of, of advisors and, and market commentators at the end of 2022 were calling for a continuation of what we had seen, a continuation of, you know, equity markets going through a tough time. You know, we'd have interest rates filter through uh, and, you know, the real economy suffering more. But we've actually seen a, a complete reversal in almost all of these key asset classes. So, you know, the first two there, you've seen equities flip on their heads and we've seen, you know, really, you know, really strong returns, particularly out of your US equity market. Um, and on the other side of the chart, we've seen, you know, last year where commodities uh, and oil did quite well, this year doing quite poorly, which is interesting because those are more, you know, more of your real economy indicators and, and mm -hmm. they're doing poorly whilst, you know, global stock markets are doing quite well. So it's, you know, it's been, it's been more than a surprise, I'd say. Mm. I must admit, when I was looking at some of the returns of technology companies, which we'll, I'll be talking about them in the back half of tonight, um, I must admit, I was kind of blown away just checking some of the returns from those types of companies, like the large cap US companies, like the Apples, the Amazons, those types of businesses of the world. Because if you go back 12 months, 
people were saying how, wow, like all these companies have overhired, you know, how is advertising going to go in this, you know, environment and so on and so forth. And there were so many different things to consider. But one of the questions that I have for you, and I'm so glad you provided a chart on this, mate, is I would love it if you can take some time to explain when you're building a portfolio, how important it is to understand how things move together. Because obviously on this chart, we can see that we've got, it looks like the, the US share market, the S&P 500 going up one year, down the next. And then if you go over here, it looks like it's the other way around for this commodities mm -hmm. um, chart right here. Um, and so like things not moving in the same direction. Now you and I, you obviously doing the CFA program, know what this means. But a lot of people who build portfolios and do it themselves don't actually know what this means. So mm -hmm. can you explain to us why this is important. And yeah. I know you've got your charts here, so I'll bring us down to this. Yeah, even if we go back up to the previous okay. graph, we can kind of visualize it here. So if over these two years you had just held the S&P 500, now I'm going to turn this into a bit of a theoretical example, but over those two years you've pretty much netted off to your returns to be around 0%, right? And you've seen quite a lot of volatility mm. in 20, or, 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 or risk. Uh, as, as we call it in, in the financial industry. So you've had a lot of risk in terms of your, your, your portfolio's gone quite far down and back quite far up again. It's, and that's, that can be you know, quite you know, hard to stomach for investors. On the flip side, we look at the, you know, let's look at oil on the flip side there. In 2022, you saw really strong performance. And the next year, you know, weak performance in 2023. And again, if we pretend those two were lined up exactly, that would net out to zero as well. So then if you imagine putting together a portfolio of, the S&P 500 and oil in this half theoretical, half you know, realistic example, over those two years, you would have achieved the same returns, in this case, be it 0%. Um, but the downturn in um, equities in one year and the upturn or the, or the good performance in oil in the same year would mean your volatility is much, much lower. So you're achieving mm. the same amount of returns for a much lower level of risk. Um, and when we think about you know, more broadly about building portfolios and particularly the core part of your portfolio, what we're really aiming to do is maximize our returns for a given level of risk. Um, so I think that visualizes it quite well, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, and that's, that's excellent. And I've just got a comment to zoom in a bit, um, which is mm -hmm. fine. I will do that because some of the things are a little bit small, so I'll try and zoom in a bit. So you mentioned there trying to, I guess, make sure that whatever return you're trying to achieve, you're trying to do it with the least amount of risk. And we can kind of see that on display here um, where we're trying to add assets that are kind of complementary in a way. Exactly right. And by doing so, by adding these assets that perform in different manners in different times, we're able to benefit from the diversification of those two assets and combine them together. And by doing so, and this goes back to, you know, um, back to or you, both of us were talking about the CFA earlier. This is modern portfolio theory, uh, Harry Markowitz. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's talking about, as I mentioned, maximizing your returns for that same level of portfolio risks. And by varying the weights in your portfolio or, you know, varying the weights of your asset classes, you're able to able to do so. So, in the most classic example is stocks and bonds. Um, mm -hmm. Historically, stocks and bonds, and, and you know, this hasn't been true over all periods, and I'm sure we'll get to that later in the in, in the webinar. But historically, stocks and bonds have been you know fairly uh, non correlated to one another, even negatively correlated to one another. Uh, so this means that you know by combining the two in your portfolio, you're able to reduce the amount of volatility. Uh, and risk you're taking on uh, for and maximize returns to that level of risk. Mm. So you've actually shown us and you've crunched all the numbers here. So thankfully you did it um, and um, you probably did a better job of it than me, but I'm going to just zoom in here really quickly uh, and show everyone on the show what uh, like a portfolio analyst would look at day in, day out. Mm -hmm. And just quickly show people across the screen. You may have to go back and watch this or pause it, but these are sometimes available online if you know what to Google. When we call this correlation, we call this a correlation matrix, right? And it's really important to understand, Tom, 
but why is it important to understand? And maybe we can zoom in on this bit right here. Yeah, so th this can help us when we're constructing portfolios since we're looking to hold assets that aren't strongly correlated. So for instance, if we create a portfolio of just the ASX 200, um, that's always going to move with itself, right? That's all you're holding. Um, back to this, you know, the theory saying we want to hold assets that don't necessarily move together all at the same time, because that'll mean when one asset moves down, another asset could be moving up or another direction. And then that benefits us from a, a risk or a volatility standpoint. Um, and we can see on the, the this part of the correlation matrix here, what we're looking at is the correlation of these various, you know, major asset classes against the ASX 200. Um, over the last 30 years. And what you can see and what you'd probably expect uh, is that, you know, the ASX 200 and the S&P 500, two, you know, broad equity markets, albeit, you know, quite different geographies and sector makeup, they have a fairly high correlation to one another. Um, but if you look at something like the Australian or the Bond Composite, which is our broad bond indice here in Australia, you can see a correlation of almost zero, um, you know, in, in some periods or in a lot of periods, you'll see a negative correlation for, for stocks and bonds, meaning historically when stocks have moved up, bonds have moved down. In this example, over the past 30 years, a correlation of zero means there's no real relationship between stocks moving up and the direction bonds are going in. Mm. So I just want to double click on that. Um, so for folks that are thinking, well, how does this translate into my portfolio? Well, if you think about it, and I'll bring up my Mr. Squiggle really quickly. If you think about it, each one of these things down the side of your page here are different things that you could invest in. And there's probably an ETF for that, right? We could probably say there's an ETF for that, right? Yeah, there's, there's an ETF for each one of these on screen. Yeah, yeah there you go. So you might have uh, an, you know, an Australia 200 ETF, and you might want to know how it reacts with other things. So if you own the S&P 500 ETF, you know that they're positive, uh, positive. So they're probably going to move in the same direction, not perfectly in the same direction, obviously, but they're going to move in the same direction, right? And you mentioned here with this one, with bonds, it's probably not going to move ex exactly the same as your shares, for example. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly it. And that's a crux of it. And then, yeah, taking that step back, I guess, to, to the overriding theme of the conversation today and constructing your core portfolio, depending on, you know, you have to first determine, I mean, before even we talked about risk and return, we probably should have talked about, you know, it's really important to determine what your investing outcomes are and the level of risk you're willing to take on. And that typically determines the type of assets you can invest into um, and, you know, how much you'll want to blend these different asset classes with one another. Mm. Um, I think we'll, we'll probably get into more of that a little later. That's just a, a yeah, a bit mm. more high level. So I guess then, the, so the natural question that we've got is from this, we can see so far, we've got different returns, different times. We can blend things together. And this is the important thing that people don't grasp straight away is we can blend things together, but not necessarily reduce the return, which is really interesting. So, People, you know, we'll come to this towards the end, but like people are sometimes like, well, why not just do 100% of this or 100% of that? And it's mm -hmm. all or nothing, but you can actually blend things together and better, get a better outcome over time. Mm -hmm. But one of the studies, Tom, that you and I would have come across a lot, but maybe folks haven't, is this one right here. Now, I love this, and this has been debated until the cows come home. Yeah. And there's been many iterations of this, and I'm just going to bring up the chart a little bit so everyone can see it above our heads. Uh Tell us a little bit more about this because mm -hmm. this is something we've t touched on on the show quite a bit, but probably not enough. Okay, yeah. And it, yeah, it, I think it has been debated given the timing of the study. And the, but I think what, what holds true is the outcome of the study. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if we did it again, it'd be so compelling. Um, but I think the, the overriding principle would stand. That's what's really important uh, for investors in understanding uh, the the actual study itself. So what, what this study is, is looking into is based on a selection of, it was based on a selection of US portfolios back in 1986. Um, it was, yeah, Br Brinson, Hood and Bebauer looked to determine what was actually contributing to the movements of portfolios and returns of portfolios. And what they found was that the asset class decisions, or the decisions of how much to put in my 
uh, equity portfolio, how much to put in my bond portfolio, my cash within that larger core um, determined, you know, 94% of the actual portfolio's outcomes and returns and market timing and individual stock selection only contributed about 6.4% or, or with my rounding 6%. Um, so mm -hmm. what this is saying is it's really important when you're, you know, when an investor is looking to achieve their desired investment outcomes to have those well-defined, understand what asset classes are appropriate given that, that outcome. Um, and I can use a more practical example. So if you're a very young investor with a very, very long time horizon, you know, it might not be inappropriate to just use equities, for instance, in your portfolio. They have the you know, highest risk, um, but someone with that in that nature may have quite a high risk tolerance. Mm. On the flip side, if you've got an investor, you know, who's nearing retirement, they don't have much stomach for risk. Um, you know, they need to be drawing on this investment income to live. Then something like, you know, fixed income like bonds or even even cash. You know, cash is a key asset class that right now is returning, you know, pretty compelling rates, right? So, and then in the middle, which is what this speaks to, is in the middle. You know, how can you use those asset classes together? So, you know, 60-40 in equities and bonds is the is the classic example. Mm. Um, and the choice of those percentage weightings really is what determining your portfolio returns over the over the long run. I feel like the way you're explaining this is so uh, so well put. Um, so mm -hmm. for folks again, let's just loop this back into this right here. So what we're basically saying here is it's not so much about which uh, shares you pick in the ASX 200, but just have the ASX 200. It's not so much which, you know, US sh shares you buy, but just have the US shares. Um, and that's uh, like, based, this is this study, the reason why this study has been debated is because it's such a polarizing topic for obviously people who work in the industry. Um, but this study was not the only one that kind of found, as you say, a similar outcome. So it's like, again and again, it keeps rearing its head. Now, one of the questions we get, okay, is like so far, everyone's like, okay, so far, so good. Um, I want to diversify. I want to do this, but, you know, I'm only getting started. How can I do it? So mm -hmm. maybe just we don't have to spend too long on this because most basically everyone that listens to this is an investor already. Mm -hmm. But how much do you need to get this type of diversification? Yeah, this is the amazing one of the amazing things that ETFs have largely enabled and I've used an example on screen here. It's our diversified all growth ETF. Um, and so you can buy a unit in this ETF for, you know, one unit's less than, less than $50. And with that unit, you're getting exposure across 8,000 equities uh, across 60 different countries. So the amount of diversification you can now get with, you know, any sum of money is, is, is incredible. Um, so there's no, from, from that perspective, there's no right or wrong amount uh, to start investing with uh, without the ability to achieve diversification. Mm. Um, yeah, so this is a really good one because the, this type of ETF is relatively new in the scheme of things of what we've seen. Obviously, it's a few years old now, but uh, relatively new and a lot of people can use these as like a big building block, not just one of the building blocks, but a big building block in that core portfolio. Okay, so let's let's talk about something else. Many listeners of the show, Tom, like Jeremy here, who's just commented, he's been um, a regular, although he did have a bit of a sabbatical there when he um, when he had a, a new addition to the family. So fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, but many people will know that I talk about this idea of market timing a lot and how, at least in your core portfolio, it's probably not as important as you think. Mm -hmm. Now, I always quote a US study, mm -hmm. but naturally, you and the team at BetaShares have figured out a way to do this without requiring us to go to the USA to get our frills. So can you talk us through this chart right here? Yeah, this it's it's a great study. You the original study you refer to, the, the Schwab study. And we 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 also liked it so much that we thought we should we should, you know, look to do something similar in the Australian market. Um, and what it, it, it's it comes back to even even the, the start of Prezo, it, it's been a surprising year and a lot of new investors or or, or you know experienced investors would have gone to this year going you know, maybe let's put the brakes on it. Let's let's stop investing our money. Let's let's try and time the market. I think the economy is going to go poorly, et cetera, et cetera. And then we see stock markets rally, and you go, "Well, oh, damn, I might have I might have missed out on that." Mm. And so, what this study is showing is over a you know twenty two year time period, um, 
it's worth noting we we did this over back like forty odd years, and over every time period the, the same held true. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not nit- nitpicking in times. What what it's looking at is five different theoretical investors. The first being an investor who perfectly times the market each year. So so I should say each investor is given two thousand dollars. Yep. Um, so perfect timing each year picks the bottom of the market, puts their two thousand in at that time, does the same year on year, and they of course achieve the best returns. Now. That's obviously very difficult to do. So, what are some more practical investing, um, you know, investing theses or, or investing strategies? Strategies yeah. you can use. Perfect word. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. One is, and this I think the most common is the middle one, dollar cost averaging. But that second one is invest immediately. So, what if that investor got their two thousand on the first trade day of the year? They invested. Turns out that investor would actually be the next best off over this twenty year time period. And only $13,000 behind the perfect timer, which is quite remarkable, um, mm. right? Uh, the third one along, I think, is probably the most common uh, investing strategy, being dollar cost averaging, so investing on the first trading day of each month. Um, and it's, it can be really good from a behavioral perspective to, to do that because it can, it can take, it, can just, it just becomes automatic, right? And it can take, you know, emotion and force out of it. Um, the final two, you know, bad timing, that's the person who picked the worst day each year. Um, and the last one is not invested, so left in a bank account. So those last two are really saying, even if you were so unlucky to pick the top of the market each year, every year, um, you still would have been, you know, forty thousand dollars better off than not investing at mm. all. Um, so it's a, a really important lesson, and comes back to that old saying, you know, it's it's all about time in the market, not not timing the market. Yeah, I love it because. Um... People like I just saw um, a comment. Who was that from? Jason. Like the interesting that investing immediately beats dollar cost averaging. And one of the reasons for that, Jason, could be that people put their money to work straight away, whereas um, you know you may be missing twenty nine days out of the thirty for that extra uh, amount of money that you're, you you you've, you've just kept on the sidelines. So it shows you again, like you said, in summary there that it is purely about just being exposed and regularly investing. And I always come back to this not investing one down the end here because I always think a lot of these studies, right, I've taken maybe towards the back half, this is not true, but in the beginning, interest rates were really high. So people were getting a good return from their bank account for many, many, many years. Um, And I still come back to this and people always say how risky the stock market is, how risky it is to invest. But clearly, all of the studies that I've come across, Tom, all of the studies, not just Mm -hmm. this one, um, point to that if you're a long-term investor, the worst possible thing you can do, the riskiest possible thing you can do is not invest. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, we all understand why that's the case, but you know, it's, it's, it's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah so, definitely. It helps to, it helps to see it in the numbers. I'd say, yeah, just, just to your, your point there, obviously very important to point out, you know, this is over the long term, right? Yeah. And shorter term, you know, who, who knows? But over the long term, that's your your better. Yeah, I strategy. think. Yeah. Well, we we can't go a full hour without quoting Buffett. He says <laughs> like this: the saying that in the short term stocks are risky, in the long term they're risky not to own. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's just like inverting that logic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this then. So you've mentioned before, like you mentioned the sixty forty portfolio, which we will get to in just a moment. Um, but a lot of people should see a financial advisor. So full warning at this stage, we don't know personal circumstances. This is just a guide that we're bringing up. This is where a good financial advisor will take into account not just your risk profile, but also your risk tolerance, which someone mentioned before. I um, wasn't sure if that, oh, that was Martin who mentioned that before. So risk tolerance and risk profile, different things, and also your capacity to take, take risks. So some people might be a high growth investor, but at the end of the day, they um they have a lot of credit card debt, or they have you know kids at home and they're a single income family and they haven't saved an emergency fund. So all of those things come into account. But yeah. just generally speaking, um, how do you like so you you how do you translate it once you see a financial advisor? How does an investment professional translate the risk profile into a portfolio? Yeah, and so it's through that asset class selection we talked about earlier. You know, since advisors and 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 not even you know, uh, yeah, since advisors, I'll stick with, uh, yeah. have a good grasp on what the riskier asset classes are and what the more defensive asset classes are, based on you know people's personal circumstances, they can start to construct that asset allocation piece around the specific you know risk tolerance and investment outcomes or needs of each investor. And so here's a here's a good fairly simplified example just using growth and defensive assets you can see 
you know, the, the high growth investor has the majority of their portfolio in, you know, growth assets, which, which, which seems intuitive. Um, the balanced investor has about 50, 50. Um, and, and what this is really, you know, what the outcome of these portfolios would be is on the right hand side, the high growth, you'd have higher volatility, but higher potential for longer term performance on the left hand side you'd have much greater capital stability um, and, and less potential for long-term great performance uh, mm. like the high growth uh, investor. It's interesting. Another way which you phrased it here in this chart as well is that some people really struggle to grasp the idea of volatility. They're like in the future, they because the standard risk profile might go something like, how would you feel if your portfolio falls 30%? And then some people think, yeah, it'd be okay. And then it actually happens and they for lack of a better phrase, they wet the bed and they just mm -hmm. get out, right? Mm -hmm. They uh, they don't know what to do. But another way to turn this is to say how many negative years might this result in? And you can see that the more uh, you turn up the growth, the more likely there would be a negative year. Uh, so here we can see it was at less than six in every 20 years or greater than six. Um, so you can see that there, right? Um, and that's a really good way to frame it. So people that might be sitting at home thinking, well, yeah, okay, but what does it actually mean? Well, there you can see it. Um, I wanted to insert another thing here, and I'm glad that you brought this up. I'll let you explain the chart. But one thing that often doesn't come into account when people think about their risk is actually a few different things. But the most important is obviously their behavior, how you actually behave with your investment portfolio. So how do you actually make decisions? Um, and normally you don't make that with a rational mind. That's the whole problem with finance is we think everyone's rational and it's all done through a spreadsheet. You mentioned Harry Markowitz before. I think it was him in a Jason Zweig interview. He was asked, well, how do you invest your money? If you invented this whole portfolio theory thing, how do you invest your money? And he's like, i am paraphrase. He said something to the effect of, um, I put 50-50 stocks and bonds just because I would feel bad if the stock market went up and I'd feel bad if it went down, something like that. So he had an even spread. Uh, and this is the godfather of all this theory. But anyway, I, I truly believe that the more someone teaches themselves and learns about investing, the more comfortable you will be taking risk because you can explain it. It's like when, when I was growing up, not to have too much detail, Tom, but when I was growing up, I had an outside toilet on the farm mm -hmm. and my brother and I used to get really scared when we used to go to the toilet, even as teenagers, like what's in the dark. We don't know, but during the day we were fine to go out there. It's just that we didn't know what we didn't know. Right. It's a great we, analogy. <laughs> well, yeah. Other than maybe the toilet part, but, um, <laughs> but uh, people will be familiar with the outhouse in Australia. So um, like as soon as you turn on the lights and people understand what's happening, they, they're they much more comfortable to go out in the dark and to go out and where it's uncertain. But anyway, this chart was really interesting because I know the study studies that you're referencing here, but can you explain this? Because this is fundamental to any investor, but especially someone who invests in an ETF or a managed fund. Yeah, no, exactly right. And I think you know, a lot, of, a lot of the conversation, a lot of what we're coming back to, to, to your analogy almost is, you know, some of these key financial theories that once you understand them, you, you, you can become a better investor. Um, and this talks about one of the financial biases uh, and, you know, the imperfection of investors in their investing. Um, so mm -hmm. what we're looking at here is the difference between what an investment returns. So from, you know, day one of an ETF or day one of a managed fund, what that fund actually returns and what the investors in that fund actually return. And the reason it's different is because not everyone's going to invest on day one. Uh, people will try and, you know, time when they invest in certain things, people will pull money out and put money back in at certain times. And the difference between what the investors receive and what the investment actually achieves is called the behavior gap, uh, which is quite an interesting um, yeah, mm -hmm. financial bias. Yeah, it's really interesting because a lot of people also don't rec recognize this, but when they look at, say, so they look at, say, like DHHF or they they look at one of these things, um, the returns of something like here, they go, oh, great. Well, I could have just had this much money in an S&P 500 or in cash or whatever. But the investors who actually invest in those funds don't do as well on average as the fund itself because they're constantly pulling money out and putting it in at the wrong time. And people do this all the time with their super funds and it drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. People call up, you know, in COVID, I heard a story of a 26-year-old that went to 50% cash and 50% bonds because they were so scared and they were told that those were the two safe things. And then obviously the stock market rallied 36% from that time and she was 26. Yeah. And so I hear stories like that and I'm like, oh, well, 
No wonder people end up shopping around for super funds or constantly changing ETFs and, and so on and so forth. So the next chart shows we've talked about, you know, all the different types of things, generally speaking. But this chart kind of shows where the things sit on a spectrum of risk. So can you maybe just talk about this? Because this is what will allow people again, and we've got another chart on this in just a moment. To, to frame this, mm -hmm. this up, uh, just yeah moment. just i guess as we go on trying to get more and more practical i guess so you had the theory up top and now saying okay so you know you're, you're speaking to an advisor or you're, you're putting together your portfolio where do different asset classes sit when you're looking for low risk and low return or you're you're, you're more comfortable potentially with higher risk and higher return and as, as a lot of your viewers you know probably already aware or, or maybe from or the conversation of tonight, you know, the lowest risk is, is cash. You know, you, you, you put cash in the bank, it's, it's very capital stable, and you still you still earn a return on that, not a pretty handy return at the moment. Um, next would be bonds. Um, and these two are kind of classified as your, your defensive assets. Bonds as well, you know, if you, if you buy a bond uh, on issue and hold it to maturity, you're going to get your original sum of money back plus coupons along the way. Uh, as we move out the chart, we're moving into... You know, asset classes that have higher volatility, higher higher chances of the prices moving up and down each year and by a, a greater degree. Um, and so we move to property, shares, and then finally alternative investments. But I think the, the most relevant point would be, you know, shares, property, fixed income, and cash for, for most for most mm. of your investors, yeah. Yeah, and here we can see it again. So a lot of these things we'll see represented um, in portfolios or in ETFs indeed. So you can think not only just how does an investment re react and how does it look like it moves in line with other parts of your portfolio up here, but also the investments themselves. And you can see that plotted again here, just in case you needed a few more examples. For example, there are ETFs that do every single one of these things, I would say up until private equity, mm -hmm. maybe not private loans, because those are a bit hard to make into an ETF. That's correct, yeah. But the others, this majority here, is available in an ETF. And so you can, if you are sitting at home watching this and you've got your portfolio open on one side, you could probably plot where everything sits on this. So how many of these do you have? How much is in that? How much is in that? Mm -hmm. And add it all up and you'll probably get a sense of where do I sit on the risk spectrum right now? Um, and it's a really simple way to do it. Now, just in the interest of time, mm -hmm. you did mention earlier on this idea of a 60-40 portfolio. Mm -hmm. Now, in our jargon, we might call this a reference portfolio. Can you maybe just explain what it is and then just elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah, of course. This is another another piece of Harry Markowitz's work. Uh, and so essentially uh, back in, when what was the state? Uh, 19, uh, I don't know, 1950s, I think it was. He, he yeah, was, it was yeah. Putting, yeah, putting together you know, an optimal portfolio. And what he did is he looked at different blends of, of stocks and bonds and he came to this portfolio that was 60% in stocks and 40% in bonds. And it turns out over the previous time period that he ran a study over, that was the most optimal portfolio to use. Um, I guess what we're going to screen here is showing, you know, actually since that study, I think well, this is, this is, this is a, a sooner time frame. So since 1995, how has that portfolio fared? And you can get a really good representation here of, your higher risk bonds in the blue line, you're seeing more volatility, more risk year on year um, and greater returns uh, by the end of it. The orange line, you're seeing, you know, less fluctuations each year, but lower returns by the end of it. So by blending these two asset classes together, you're achieving much lower volatility uh, for a certain level of returns and the, the risk adjusted returns of that 60-40 portfolio are greater than the bonds or, or the stocks themselves mm. even though the stocks total returns are greater um, adjusted for the amount of volatility that has undergone during the or during this time period um, the the 60 40 portfolio has a greatest yeah, risk adjusted return mm. i like it mate so we um so we've probably got time for one or two questions now just quick questions if you want to um fire them away uh, you can just put them in the chat here um, I could see a few different things have come through, but if you do have a question, just please drop it in the chat. We've got time with us for a few more minutes. Uh, I can see that uh, BPB said, spiders in the outhouse for sure. You've gone full circle with your opening joke. Um, well, thank you. Um, yeah, that, well, was, that, was that on purpose or? Yeah, well, I don't know. Maybe this, yeah. That would have been very high level. <laughs> I, could, I could see it coming. Investing ahead of the curve, mate. Um, I guess 
if no one else has got any questions, there was an interesting one here that um, relates to, I guess, not investing and the, the risk of holding cash. I'm curious. There was, the question was about the relationship between inflation and cash. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, would you be keen to weigh in on that? Yeah, of course. So, so talking about, you know, if you're holding cash, but, you know, inflation's running at a higher level than the interest you're earning, you're actually, you know, your, your real return is actually lower than, you know, or is, is, just, is just negative, for yeah. instance. Um, no, it's, it's, it's very true. And it is, it is a tough consideration in a high inflationary environment, right? Because it's the same for any asset class you're, you're holding. Um, if you're holding equities or bonds, you have to think about your returns, you know, net of that inflation, if you're thinking about the, the real outcome of, of how your money is being invested. Um, so it's, it's a, a really good point to raise and, 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 and to consider in portfolio construction. Yeah. One final question, maybe before we uh, nip this in the bud, uh, which was from uh, Aditya, who asked, who owns the stocks in an ETF? So at the end of the day, who owns those stocks when they're put inside an ETF? Yeah, it's a good question. So ETFs are structured as something known as a, a unit trust. Um, and actually, you know, very well, one of the most highly regulated financial instruments or unit trusts is in Australia. Um, so essentially, a custodian holds the underlying assets. Beta shares don't hold the assets. Uh, and the custodian holds those assets on behalf of the end investors. Um, so, for instance, if, if beta shares or another ETF provider went bankrupt and you know, we, we, we owed creditors lots of money, um, those assets in the ETFs themselves are safeguarded. Um, so, in practice, one of, one, of, one of two things would likely happen. Number one, another ETF provider might take over the ETF and continue its operation. Number two, the assets would be sold and the proceeds would go to the, the end investors in the fund. Mm, I love that. That's a great answer, mate. Well, this is the first time you and I have met. We still haven't met in person. Um, if I don't see you, I know you're going away on holiday, which for someone that's studying the CFA yeah. program often means that you take your textbooks with you. Um, good luck with that in November, mate. And uh, I really do appreciate you taking us through this because you did take us to an- another level in terms of everyone's understanding of ETFs and you use charts to do it in a non-offensive way, mate. So we really, really appreciate you taking some time out to join us tonight. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Sean. It was lots of fun and thanks to thanks all the viewers as well. Yeah, great. Cheers, mate. Bye for now. Yeah. So that was Tom. And uh, I told you he would bring the charts and he did indeed. So um, I did get a chance to see a few questions come through about having money in a cash account, an offset account and all that sort of stuff. Um, I have a lot of my emergency fund sitting in an offset account because cash is important. Cash is important for uh, living your life and uh, making sure you can fall asleep at night without one eye open thinking that someone's going to come and take it from you. So um, offset account, great. Um, And for a period when interest rates were really low um, in the RAS community, uh, a lot of people use their offset account instead of investing it. But more more recently, we've seen as interest rates have gone back up, all of a sudden bonds are starting to look great and all these other things are starting to look great again. Um, But Tom obviously um, was all class and I'm so glad to have him on for the fourth and final installment of the Self Wealth Live times beta shares plus beta shares um, mini series on building a core portfolio. I honestly think if you watch this back again, you will have most of the answers that you need to build a true core portfolio. I know a lot of you are thinking, well, there's a lot of different elements here, but at the end of the day, you can plot your portfolio on those charts. You can think about how they might move together. Um, You can use long-term data to determine what the likely outcome is. And if you do all these steps, a lot of people come back to me and they say, hey, Owen, you know, I saw this investment and had a 15% return or this one had a 20% return. Does that sound like it's right? If you follow all the steps that professionals take, what you tend to find is that the best portfolio managers, financial advisors tend to return on average somewhere between say 6% and say 11% over the long term. And that's because they've blended the portfolio appropriately. And if you find an investment that offers a higher potential return than that, it's oftentimes the case that it might be good for a certain amount of time, but it's not good for a long time. So that's why when we tell people to use compound interest calculators, that we say, don't put in something crazy because it's not realistic. It's not, even if it's a good return one year, it'll probably be shocking the next. And somewhere around that kind of nine to 11% is it tends to be a very, very respectable return. Um, Kumar, you've said, why do you think 
what do you think is the biggest reason why people don't invest? Is it fear of losing money? Can't see the money increasing fast enough? Well, the data tends to suggest, Kumar, this is a question you asked a little while ago. Um, so the, the data seems to suggest that there are a few major reasons. One is people don't think they know enough about investing. Two is they feel like they don't have enough money. Um, three is they feel like they it's not for them, like as in like there's too many barriers for entry. And there are three or four major reasons, but those are the big ones that we always come across and all the industry data tends to suggest the same. Uh, Raya did ask a question. What's your view on hedged versus unhedged investments for those doing geo arbitrage or just hedged versus unhedged uh, investments? Now, I will show you how I figure this out. Um, many of you will know this. I think it's on, I think it's on the RAS Media website australian i'm going to try and get this up i can't really remember where it is here we go um so this is just on our website and you can go to it then the reason why i'm referencing my own website is because i don't know any other websites that do it um but if you go and you change the chart to the maximum possible time horizon what we actually look at and i'll zoom right in here see if i can get that nice up in there we go what this actually shows you is it shows you the Australian dollar in the black. And then there's these green bands. They're called standard deviation or in the industry, we like to put stupid names to things. They're called Bollinger bands. And then you can see the moving average. That's the orange line. But anyway, if you just focus on the black line, right? That's the currency and the green line. And you can see that every time it goes down to two standard deviations. So it falls down to the bottom green line it tends to kind of stay in that range. So what this is not science. This is more just like hist history. Uh, what we tend to say to people is when the currency gets down to a low point, uh, you can look at um, hedging or you can look at making a decision based on currency. Now, I say this with caution because over the very, very long term, a lot of these decisions don't matter that much. Um, assuming you're investing in a currency like a US dollar, um, if you're investing in US shares, for example, assuming you're investing in a currency that's from a developed country. Uh, if you're investing in like emerging markets, then obviously this rule does not work. Um, you need That's a totally different thing. Um, and your hedging would probably be more expensive anyway. So I hope that makes a question. Um, and that's the answer to that question, Benny. At what point um, of currency do investors hedge? Um, at the end of the day, there's a big decision that needs to be made here. Before I move on to the next segment, there's a big decision that needs to be made here. Uh, one of those decisions is that when you sell an investment, so say you have two ETFs that do exactly the same thing, except one of them is currency hedged and one of them is not. When that happens, you're obviously going to incur tax if you sell the one and then swap it for the other one. So for most people who are investing for 10 or 20 years, it's not worth in my opinion, this is just purely general in nature. It's not worth investors selling um, just to buy the same one that's hedged unless you have a very, very, very strong opinion. And I don't often have very strong opinions on these types of things. Um, I guess like if you're in a different environment, like if you're in your retirement or something like that where you don't pay tax, of course, you can make different decisions. But Charlie Munger has this saying and he says something to the effect of compounding is very powerful. Don't interrupt it. Um, and I just think that's a great turn of phrase. Okay, so for the remainder of the, wow, seven minutes, not that long, um, I'm just going to quickly take a walk on the board to uh, ASX reporting season. For those of you that don't know, um, during August and February every year, companies in Australia, not every company, but a lot of them, tend to release their financial results to the market. And um, at the end of the month of August, there's still some results coming out now and you typically get, get the worst ones towards the end. Um, but at the end of the month, I like to do a bit of a recap on what I've seen in the month and um, come up with kind of like a best and worst list. But in this case, I'm going to be optimistic and say that there's mostly a best list. Um, and many of these companies you will be familiar with because you watch Self Wealth Live every single week on a Wednesday night. So, um, oh, just quickly, Kamal, you've said um, currency hedged would be a higher cost as well, won't it? Yes. So if you get a currency hedged ETF, so say you get a US shares ETF and it's currency hedged, that will cost a little bit more. So that eventually will um, reduce the return. But you may get a benefit from it. Like if I was in retirement, if I was dealing with a retirement portfolio right now, I would actively be considering currency hedging. I would actively be considering that. But I'm still planning to invest for 
20, 30 years. So for me, I'm aware of it and I will manage it if I can tax effectively, but it's not always the first and most important rule for me. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, so um, results. So companies that come out with financial results, uh, Altium here uh, is a company that I've followed for many years, as well as Rask members have followed Altium for many years. Altium creates software for printed circuit boards. Wow. What does that mean? Okay. So it creates the software that designers and engineers can use to design all of those electric bits that go inside of devices. So even this mouse that I've got in my hand here, if you can see that, my iPhone, this computer, the camera that I've got over there, um, this Google Home thing, all of them, these smart devices have a little board inside them called a printed circuit board, this thing right here. And you can use the Altium software to design that. And uh, thousands of people right around the world use this software and it's charged on a subscription. Um, you can buy it once off as well. So here's the subscription version. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, and they even use the same language as the iPhone SE. Um, there you go. So many of the companies in the world use it, even companies like uh, Tesla use it. But Tesla will also use the competitors' products as well, but just gives you a sense. So obviously, it's a big play on, I guess, um, it's a big play on the, the Internet of Things. Um, I'm going to bring up an article that I wrote the other day, just really quickly. Um, while that loads, hopefully it loads. So... Um, I wrote an article on this the other day. There's a printed circuit board for anyone that's interested. i get that out of the way. So one of the competitors, I think the big news, even though Altium shares jumped like 30% on the day and I was really disappointed because I wanted to buy some more. Um, the big news in this space in recent months has been that some of the competitors have adopted artificial intelligence into the design of their printed circuit boards. So Altium's competitors are starting to use AI to help their users design printed circuit boards. And you can see an example here from the Cadence Systems, which is one of Altium's competitors. Uh, and you can see here, they've created this new version, which is like the AI improved printed circuit board, right? And here we can see that something that took the AI plus human 75 minutes and it got 14% better wire length, took just the human by themselves three days. So we can see three days just for the human or 75 minutes for human plus AI. And I remember talking with Australia's leading futurist about this a couple of months ago, uh, Steve Sammartino. I spoke to him on the Australian Investors Podcast. And um, he was talking about how in the future, when we can implant these chips into our brain, uh, these AI chips into our brain, um, there'll be the people that refuse AI and the people that want to be AI enabled. And this is an example of in real life um, right now, um, software engineers and companies are incorporating AI into their business. And so this is a threat that people should be aware of before they invest into Altium. But for the most part, Altium's results were really uh, excellent. They were truly excellent. Uh, this is the competitor's stock price right here. You can also see that they're doing well. Um, interestingly enough, you see this thing down in the bottom corner here. Let me just go down. You see this? Uh, it's right behind my image. You see this thing right down the bottom corner here? Some of you may be wondering what this thing in Canva is right here. So this thing right here is Canva's version of AI enabling whatever it is that you're doing. So just like you can get a piece of software to design a printed circuit board, you can also get AI to help you design a spreadsheet. And people that use Microsoft Office will be familiar with that as well. Um, so that's something uh, to keep in mind. Uh, so I saw a question here from Vivi. Altium jumped big twice, once in 2021 and then now. Still sitting, waiting for below $24. Uh, $24 doesn't look like it's going to happen. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, I remember when it re received a takeover off of VV. Um, it was somewhere in here. Um, I remember thinking, wow, like they should take the offer. And then it dropped. Um, I, didn't, I didn't take the opportunity to buy it here, but I wish I did. I think I could have really got a bargain, but I suppose hindsight's a wicked thing. Okay, so um, in short, I think if you're going to buy Altium or if you're thinking of putting it in your watch list, I think you should also put this company on your watch list, Cadence Systems, which is the creator of the Allegro um, toolkit, which you just saw. Uh, and you should also put some of the other companies that are not necessarily competitors, but in the same space. Um, so Autodesk is one, it's a bit more acquisitive. And another one is called Ansys, uh, A-N-S. This. 
Um, I took the double S. This company as well. And as you can see, the returns from some of these companies are just unbelievable. So I would put them all on the watch list and go from there. So the next company um, will need probably no introduction to everyone that watches this or listens to Rask podcasts. Promedicus does medical device software. So it does the software that enables you to send and receive uh, medical images in seconds. Um, it's just the world leader um, at what it does. Uh, even though it's just a tiny little Australian company, I'll be really quick with the results. Overall, extremely positive. Um, a record year. They basically say that every year. This is the number one chart that matters for Promedicus. And here you can see all of the different sources of revenue for the business. So here we can see the bulk of the revenue comes from what they call exam. So every time someone gets an image, it's sent across to the radiologist, et cetera, et cetera. You can see how much revenue they are making right now. Incredible. And that's all recurring. And it's all really high profit margin. So it's a really good business. It's undeniable that Promedicus is a fantastic business. It's just a case of how much do you pay for the shares? Are the shares are a little bit expensive? Yes, they are. Um, so you've just got to weigh that up. If you go back a couple of weeks to Self Wealth Live, I think it was about a month, uh, we did a session on how to value high growth shares. So I direct you back there. Um, really good result, A plus result, A plus result, definitely from both of those. And an A, maybe an A minus, do they still do those? A minus result from RPM Global. RPM Global sells software to uh, mining companies. So here we go. It, um, here we go. So L, uh, RPM Global sells software and like the other two businesses, but mostly like Altium, RPM Global sells software on subscription, but not all of it is on subscription. Sometimes it sells perpetual licenses. Now, what's important to understand is they're basically forcing their mining clients to move across to a subscription. And those subscriptions are over three to five years. So they take less upfront for their subscription. It's like when you used to buy Microsoft Office on a CD. No one does that anymore. Um, now everyone just gets it online. Um, but for Microsoft at first, that was a bad thing because it meant that they didn't get the big upfront fee for the CD, but they just took the monthly subscription instead. Same thing, um, different company. And so if we go down, where is the best chart? Da, 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 da. Here, I think it's this one. So here you can see the amount of software that's yet to be uh, recognized in the business. So in the future, you can see the different software amounts that they know that they've got baked in. It's, it's not guaranteed, but it's basically it's close to guaranteed as you get in this game. They're going to make more revenue in the future. Uh, just a quick view of their clients. You can see BHP. There is another chart and I can't remember where it is. I'm probably not going to be able to find it right now. No, nope, I cannot find it. That's okay. Um, basically, this business is probably, what does Richard Matthews, the CEO, say? He'd, he'd probably say something like it's in the third year of a three or four year transition. Um, I'd say it's maybe like a... I'd say it's in the seventh year of a 15 year transition um, because it's been since 2012, this business has fundamentally changed. It's still a relatively small business and it's probably the only one of the businesses that I've mentioned tonight that has fallen recently. So I personally think that this is the type of business that could be on someone's watch list. It's not risk-free. It obviously depends on mining. Um, it, it's got a bit of an uglier side of its business too that is still slowly working through. But um, for the long term, you've got a line CEO, a really interesting software business. Uh, so that's basically all I've got to say for that. Um, VV, Owen, would you analyze bank financials one day? Absolutely. Like CBA or Westpac. Absolutely, VV. We've done that on the show before, and I'd be happy to do it again in the next couple of months. Um, CP, you've said, how strong do you reckon Altium's moat is? I think it's very strong. But here's how I would frame this CP. Altium is competing against competitors that are 10 or 20 times its size. Those competitors typically occupy the most expensive types of customers. So in the design elements and the software part of the market, they tend to do a very good job of that. Altium is kind of like this up and comer. And by that, I mean, it's been, it's been doing this for like 30 years, but it's, it's software is probably as good, maybe better than some of the competitors, but it's, it's coming up, meaning that, it's taking its really good software that you can just buy off the shelf, which is very rare in that industry, and it's slowly creeping it higher. It's slowly pushing bigger and bigger customers into the ecosystem or maybe clawing them down into it. So companies like Bosch or Tesla or these types of businesses, it's trying to move more into enterprise customers. And so 
I think that that's a sign that they think that they can start to take on some of their bigger competitors. So I actually think they wouldn't be able to do that unless they believe they had a strong competitive advantage. Also worth noting, I did a bit of a calculation the other day and what I found was that the CEO of LTM now owns about, I could be wrong, just off the top of my head, about $400 million worth of shares. And he's been with the business for a very, very, very long time. Now, when the CEO of a business owns about $400 million of shares, I think to myself, there's probably a reason for that. Um, so I get a lot of confidence from that. Um, Paul, thoughts on Volpara for the next Premedicus? I did think that for a while, and I think they got bogged down in too much science. I think Volpara is turning very interesting recently, Paul. I can do another show on that. Um, okay, so um, what's coming up? We've got to just flick back onto this really quickly. I'm going to end with the quote, and then I'm going to end with an update about Self Wealth Live. So how much pain has cost us the evils which have never happened? Thomas Jefferson. I've created this little chart for you here. We prepared something in advance. Um, there was another study, and someone mentioned, I can't remember who it was, what's this 74% thing in the top corner here? And I asked Kate, my co-host on the Australian Finance Podcast, for a study. But before I get to that, what this quote refers to is this idea that people are so fearful of a market crash that when a market crash actually happens, they're even more fearful. So no matter what happens, whether the stock market goes up, it's going to crash. Whether the stock market goes down, it's going to keep falling. Very few people actually ever just stop and think, well, yeah, it could probably crash. And technically, we're getting closer to the next market crash than the last one. But over the long term, all these crashes seem to come and go. And so what I would encourage everyone to do is to look at the long term of most stock markets around the world. By that, I mean 10 or 20 years. Take a look and tell me what you think. See if you can draw a line through it and tell me if it looks different to that. Now, this is about investing, this quote up here. It's not technically, but we've turned that into an investing quote. There was another study, and I can't remember exactly where it came from. Um, and I can't, I, Kate sent me this. I don't know if this is the right one or not. But basically, there is a study that shows something that people are more fearful of not saving enough than the, what was the, it's like the fear that they get when they actually save the amount of money, they're still more fearful than ever before. So even if they save the money that they think they should save, they're still fearful of not saving more money. Um, and it's the same thing that we see in investing. And it's a really interesting turn of psychology um, that people tend to fear the thing that they fear and that outweighs any pleasure of actually navigating it successfully or even just being in it. So, um, this too shall pass, says Caroline. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, Joe Bloggs, EML. I haven't looked at the EML report yet. Um, it couldn't have got worse. Let me put it that way. Um, basically what happened there. So uh, I still am yet to review that. Go and check out. I'll be back next week. You can ask me then. And I probably would have got to the annual report by then because I think it only came out this morning. I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, but I, I wanted to end with a bit of an update, re-Self Wealth Live. So over the next few weeks, not next week, I'll be back next week at 6 p.m., we might be sprucing things up a bit. So just as a bit of a kind of update on things to come, I'm pretty excited about what comes next for Self Wealth Live. Um, so be sure to come back next week, 6 p.m., and I'll be able to share all the details with you. But there are going to be some really big positive changes. I'm excited because we're going to have more I think CEOs on the show, like business leaders from around Australia, we're going to have so many different guests and like, and I mean heavy hitters. So stay tuned. Some exciting announcements. We've been running Self Wealth Live, um, Rask and the team at Self Wealth for around about two years, I'm going to guess. And um, we've achieved some pretty awesome things, but I think things are about to get even better, even better, you could say. Not a better disclaimer, Jason. I think, well, yes, actually, there will be a better disclaimer. But I think there will be fewer disclaimers. So keep that in mind. New picture in the background. This picture will probably never change, Martin. This one says Palm Cove. For any of you that haven't been to Palm Cove, north of Cairns, 20 minutes. Get yourself up there, Jetstar, for 120 bucks. Really good place to go. I might recommend Nunu Restaurant. If you haven't been there already, that's where that photo's from. Um, 
Lots and lots and lots to <laughs> Rask getting listed on the ASX. Unlikely CP, uh, but stay tuned because next week I'll be able to provide a formal update. Rob will be back with us. Um, so, all right, guys, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for tolerating the, um, the outhouse reference. Don't forget, as Andrew said in the chat, the, um, the self-wealth plus beta shares uh, prize pool competition thing. Uh, ends tomorrow night. So you may as well do it. it. Takes 40 seconds. Nautilus in Port Douglas, says Martin. I would agree with that. Nautilus up in the trees. Get yourself a bit of a white tablecloth dinner. Uh, chuck the kids out for a night and go and do it for yourself. Um, good night, everyone. Good night, Paul. We'll be back next week. I'll be sharing more of these exciting details with you then. Bye for now. Have a great night. Stay safe.